Uh, welcome to the Where's Grid Compute Canada webinar on uh, software-defined rendering, on CPU-based rendering. My name is Alex Razumov. I am a visualization coordinator with Where's Grid and Compute Canada. And today we're going to talk about how to do rendering on CPUs with our GPU in, inside. A lot of people uh, run large models on the clusters, and uh, normally they have um, a lot of data that come out of these simulations and often they need to visualize these data sets. Uh, so the typical workflow is to find a GPU node, uh, perhaps on the same cluster, and uh, visualize the data there, or perhaps use a standalone uh, specially purposed visualization workstation, which would typically have a lot of memory and many cores and will have one or several GPU cards, and so you will uh, visualize your data there. Or perhaps if a data set is small, you can also download to, to your own personal desktop or, or your own laptop and visualize it there. So in all these cases, uh, you would use a GPU hardware acceleration to do rendering and also perhaps do some part of the processing. And uh, G uh, hardware acceleration works through uh, standard graphics APIs. So in almost all cases, that means OpenGL, which is a very popular library for, well, I'm not actually, it's not actually a library, it's an API implemented by hardware uh, uh, vendors, uh, graphics card hardware vendors in their um, GPU drivers. So OpenGL has been around for more than 20 years now, and it's uh, it's an industry standard for uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional graphics acceleration on the GPU cards. And pretty much all popular three-dimensional and two-dimensional two as well scientific visualization packages nowadays uh, support rendering by OpenGL. But of course, to use the OpenGL and to use um, these visualization packages, uh, traditionally you have to have uh, traditional limitation uh, has been that you have to have a GPU card to be able to do uh, GPU rendering. Uh, so the problem is that very often a GPU node, the GPU card might not be available. So nowadays a lot of people run general purpose uh, simulations on uh, GPU cards. There are lots of packages like NAMD, Gromax, and many others uh, that support um, well, they support computing on the GPU. So a lot of GPU nodes are very busy in Compute Canada nowadays. And also many systems simply don't have GPU nodes. In fact, uh, in Westgrid, all of our classes, except for one uh, parallel, uh, don't have GPU cards. And so the problem is if you use any of these GPU-less clusters uh, to compute something, then you would have to copy data over to the parallel clusters to visualize it. And if your data set is uh, large, many gigabytes or several terabytes, then obviously this is uh, a bottleneck that you will want to avoid. So fortunately, it's actually very much possible to do an entire visualization pipeline on a CPU without any GPU inside. There are two options. Either you can use a software rasterizer or you can use software ray tracer. So some people uh, might not uh, be aware of uh, the difference between a rasterizer and a ray tracer, so I'm going to explain uh, it briefly now. A rasterizer uh, is a more traditional and simpler technique, and it's actually faster. So when you do rasterization, uh, what you do is, uh, in your scene, uh, you have uh, uh, you typically a large number of surfaces, and these surfaces that you want to visualize are composed of polygons, two-dimensional polygons, so for example, triangles. And you take, you go through all these polygons, and you project them onto the uh, surface of the screen. And so it's a sim simple projection from, a, uh, from some orientation to the flat uh, polygon. And um, you can also include a lighting effect. So you can calculate how light is distributed in some primitive fashion. But rasterizers are not particularly good for calculating uh, lighting effects and for cal calculating shadows as well. So they're very fast, but they're kind of proximate. On the other hand, ray traces are much more accurate. So ray traces are famous for producing very photorealistic renderings, uh, but they're more expensive. So in a ray tracer, you essentially fill up a volume with a large number of rays. These rays either originate at the light source or uh, typically in, in, uh, in um, scientific visualization uh, in your eye, and then they go from your eye through all pixels on the screen, and then they uh, continue into the volume and bounce throughout the volume reflecting from surfaces, uh, being absorbed in volumes, and so on. And perhaps you can also add scattering. And as long as you have a sufficient number of uh, rays and you do uh, you, you calculate the, uh, the propagation of light along these rays properly, you can actually do amazingly beautiful, amazingly realistic visualizations. But of course, because it relies on a large number of rays, it can be very slow compared to uh, rasterizers. So um, 
for software rasterizers, uh, the traditional approach uh, is, a, uh, so, uh, is a library called uh, Mesa. So Mesa is an open source implementation of the uh, OpenGL specification. So traditionally, as I mentioned, OpenGL is usually provided in, hard well, in hardware drivers by the vendors of the GPU cards. But Mesa will actually let you use an open source package uh, to, well, to do OpenGL. And uh, Mesa can use both uh, hardware uh, hardware drivers and uh, software rasterizers. So there are a number of software rasterizers that you can plug into uh, Mesa. So you have to compile Mesa with support for a particular rasterizer. The uh, two of interest to us are the uh, Gallium LLVM pipe. It's an older rasterizer that's been around for a number of years. And the new open SWAR software rasterizer from Intel, which is uh, much, much faster than LLVM pipe. And on the ray tracer front, uh, you have, there are also many implementations. And today I'm going to talk about a new library called Osprey. So this library came out probably a couple of years ago from uh, maybe a year and a half ago. From, um, it, it was, um, it was uh, coded by Intel, but it's open source. So anybody can download the source code and compile it themselves. And it implements a number of um, uh, recent developments in uh, the ray tracing algorithm. So it's actually much, much faster than uh, more traditional uh, software ray tracers. So uh, underneath, uh, Osprey uh, uses um, what is called the Intel's um, Single uh, Program Multiple Data Program Compiler, ISPC, uh, to properly target, to properly do uh, vectorization on a, 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 a number of uh, various processor architectures. Um, so it also built on top of uh, a low-level ray tracing library called Embry. So Embry itself uh, is not used for, uh, for um, rendering images. It's not a user-facing library. It's a very low-level low level library. But uh, this is a library that implements a number of advances in uh, ray tracing algorithms, uh, l letting you do ray tracing uh, five, six, maybe even 10 times faster than the uh, more traditional older algorithms. Uh, so Paraview Visit uh, VMT Visual Model Dynamics, the popular three-dimensional scientific visualization packages, already use Osprey uh, to some extent. And today I'm going to talk about the implementation of Osprey in, in Paraview. So uh, it's the same spirit as OpenShell. Basically, Osprey will let you do ray tracing of both surfaces and volumes, uh, but the API is totally different. So you cannot use Osprey as a plugin uh, for OpenShell. It's a totally different uh, API. That means that your package, so prior view visit, whatever, has to be compiled with Osprey support from scratch. Uh, so uh, it can um, render polygonal surfaces, as expected, and it can also render non-polygonal geometry. So things like cones, spheres, uh, streamlines, cylinders are also natively supported by Osprey. Uh, Osprey has a very small memory footprint. So for one polygon, it takes somewhere between 50 and 100 bytes in memory. So on a, a single workstation, single large sh uh, shared memory workstation, uh, you can actually do uh, up to several hundred million triangles, several hundred million polygons, and up to several billion particles on a single workstation, on a, uh, on a single multi-core workstation, as long as you have uh, sufficient memory to uh, fit in all these um, these elements in, in memory. And Osprey is ray tracing essentially. So that means that it can be incredibly accurate. It provides ambient occlusion. So ambient occlusion is the detailed calculation of how light is distributed across uh, surfaces. And also it provides sh shadows. You can enable them. There is a chat box I'm gonna show you. And it gives uh, much more photorealistic uh, renderings. And the speed of Osprey is really, it really depends on your setup. So depending on how many options you turn on, depending on how many rays you uh, choose to use and so on. So it can, can be actually surprisingly fast compared to OpenGL. And there are three backup devices that are supported by Osprey. Uh, the local device for rendering on a single CPU, a quiet device for rendering on the first generation Azure 5 cards, and an MPI device for uh, MPI parallel uh, rendering. So I'm not quite sure actually if MPI device is supported in Paraview's implementation of Osprey. I have not managed to make it work, so I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit uh, more about this uh, towards the end of, the, uh, of this webinar. Uh, so first, uh, Osprey was implemented a couple of years ago uh, as a plugin by the Texas Advanced Computing Center. A plugin is called PV Osprey. Uh, it's still available, you can still download it, but it's a separate plugin, which means that it's not included into Paraview. So you have to download it as a binary or compile it yourself, and then uh, you'll go to Tools, Manage Plugins, and then enable that plugin, and it'll be available for, well, for, for, for rendering. But starting from uh, the most recent version of Paraview 5.1, uh, which came out a few months ago, 
Osprey is now actually directly integrated into Paraview. And officially it's supported in Linux and Mac OS, but it's actually included into the Windows uh, pre-compiled version of Paraview as well. Uh, so they say it's experimentally supported in Windows, but my understanding that it works, so I don't have Windows on my, uh, on my laptop, so I cannot check it, but I've been told that it works and works pretty well in Windows as well. So the idea is that in Paraview at runtime, you can actually switch between OpenGL rasterization uh, and Osprey ray tracing in real time as you interact with your visualization. I'm going to show you how to do this exactly. If you compile, if you compile Paraview uh, yourself, if for some reason you don't like to use the uh, pre-built, pre-compiled uh, version of Paraview, uh, you'll need a number of uh, dependencies. So you need the Intel compiler, uh, uh, I, ISPC that I mentioned before. Also, you need Intel's uh, threading building blocks uh, to uh, install Embry. Then you need to compile Embry from scratch and then you will compile Osprey, and then it will compile Paraview, uh, enabling some, uh, some flags. Most importantly, Paraview use, use Osprey uh, flag. So if you need instructions on how to compile this in Linux, uh, I certainly have them. Uh, I can, I'll be happy to provide you instructions if you send me an email. All right, so this is what Osprey looks like. Uh, so this is a static picture on the slide. And essentially, um, you don't have to do anything. You just uh, download, uh, well, start a pre-compiled version of Paraview and there will be an option to, uh, to enable Osprey. So I'm gonna do that uh, right now. This is the visualization I'm gonna show you. I actually included, so if I go back to the very first slide, uh, there is a link, um, bit.ly slash Osprey uh, bits. Uh, if you click on it in your browser, it will open a zip file, which contains a copy of these slides and also a number of uh, state files, a number of uh, Python scripts uh, that I'm gonna use today. So you can actually reproduce all of uh, the stuff I'm gonna show on uh, your own laptop. So uh, this is the first visualization I'm gonna uh, show you. And um, you can actually, uh, if, if you are on a Unix-based system, Mac OS or Linux, uh, you can simply um, use the following command, paraview uh, dash dash state equal to, uh, and the, the name of the state file. And as long as paraview is in your path, uh, that will start paraview and then you'll be able to reproduce this visualization. Alternatively, you can start Paraview, then go to file, load state file, and then navigate to the location of the state file. So that's wavelet.pbsm, and then it will uh, reproduce the visualization. So I'm gonna do that uh, from scratch. I'm just, I just wanna show you the steps that, are, uh, that I took to uh, build this uh, visualization. So let me start my own copy of Paraview. I will drag it to the shared screen. And what I'm going to do, so there is no, uh, there's no data file. I'm going to build, I'm uh, going to use built-in sources and built-in functions uh, in Paraview. So I'll go to sources and call the uh, wavelet source. So it's a three-dimensional function, so mathematical wavelets. And I'll just hit apply. I'll use the default configuration. And then I will go to filters and call, go to alphabetical and call a filter, which is called a uh, shrink filter. And what it will do, it will uh, take all the cells in my wavelet data set and uh, push the corners of the, well, the uh, edges, the edge points of the cells towards the centroid of each cell. So essentially it will separate the cells. You will, show in a uh, you will see in a second what I mean. So I'm gonna uh, pass, apply the shrink filter to the wavelet source and I'm gonna hit just use all the default values. I'm gonna hit apply. And this is the visualization I have. So you see the individual cells uh, well, the corners of the cells were pushed towards their centroid so that the cells are now separate. They don't um, form a continuous, uh, continuous block. And now on top of this, I'm gonna apply, so to the output of shrink, I'm gonna apply the uh, glyph filter. So I'm gonna um, put a source, uh, sorry, a source, a sphere on top of um, a number of uh, points, and the points are the corners of the uh, cells that you see on your screen. So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do here, uh, I set the radius of the spheres to 0.2, and then uh, the total, the maximum number of spheres is gonna be 5,000, so it's one of the parameters somewhere down here. Uh, maximum number of sample points is 5,000, so I'm gonna place 5,000 spheres on top of my data set, and I will hit apply. So here we go. Now you see both the cells uh, pushed apart and the, uh, point, and the um, glyphs, which are spheres. I'm gonna turn off the cells. So now I'm looking just at the spheres. 
And the idea of this visualization is simply to draw a large number of spheres. So there are 5,000 spheres here, and now we're visualizing them on a GPU using OpenGL, so hardware acceleration through my laptop's GPU card. Uh, now, so I click on the Glyph, on the uh, last object in the pipeline browser, and in the properties of the Glyph object, I'm gonna scroll all the way down, and you will see that uh, there are a couple of chef boxes. One says enable Osprey, the other one is so before I enable Osprey, I just want to spin the object a little bit and you see how interactive it is. So actually, sorry, uh, looking through the video presentation, uh, looking uh, through, well, through, uh, yeah, the, the video presentation, I'm actually not entirely sure how fluid it is. So on my screen, it's very fluid, it's very responsive. So you can draw many frames, uh, many frames per second. So I'm going to switch now to uh, Osprey and it, it's going to take, oh, it took a fraction of a second. So now I have a totally different rendering, looks very different. Oh, sorry, it's still, I think it's still being, it's still refreshing my rotation. So I did a lot of rotations and uh, at least what I see in my video screen. So, okay, so, okay, now we have the final picture. So now the picture is kind of different from what you saw with OpenGL rendering. So now we have uh, Osprey, we're doing Osprey rendering on the CPU without using GPU at all. And I'm gonna click on the button that says shadows. So I'm enabling shadows and the picture now is totally different. So it's dark and I'm gonna spin it around so I'll do something like this, and I will wait until it refreshes in the video. Okay, so I think here you go. So you see that the picture is totally different. We enable Osprey and we enable shadows, and it really brings up the three-dimensional nature of the data set. So you see there are shadows formed behind the individual spheres, and it really now looks three-dimensional. So it's completely different to the previous uh, rasterization we were doing with OpenGL. So one thing to be aware of, the way it's done in Osprey, and I'm not sure whether you can change that, so I haven't seen this anywhere in, in properties, is that the light source, unlike with OpenGL rasterization, where the light source is fixed, and then you will rotate the object in 3D, and the light source will stay put. Here, the light source is uh, linked to the object, so one side of the object is permanently, uh, is permanently not uh, illuminated, the other one is permanently illuminated, and I don't know actually how to correct this, so I'm not sure, I think this is uh, built into Osprey unless, well, unless there's an option that I, I just could not find, right? So I'm, not, I'm gonna now go back to my slides and mention a couple of things. Uh, so now if you want to save this visualization, you can simply go to, in Parab, you can go to File, um, Save Screenshot, and then basically specify resolution, say okay, specify the file name, file format, and so on. So uh, I noticed there's a bug uh, in this, um, in the, Paraview's implementation of Osprey. So it will work just fine as long as you save an image that is not uh, bigger than the resolution of your screen. So if you uh, try to save an image that is higher than the resolution of your screen, you will actually get some really weird interlacing problems. And I don't see the same problems on the OpenGL side, OpenGL rasterization. So in OpenGL rasterization, if you have an image in Paraview in the GUI on your screen, and if you save, let's say, at 4K resolution, it will work perfectly. It will just save the 4K, really, it will re-render the image specifically at that resolution. So for some reason, this doesn't work in Osprey. If you specify the resolution higher than the actual physical resolution of your screen, it will uh, produce, it basically will just trash the image. So the image will have some weird interlacing problems. And the only way to correct this, uh, I know, is uh, to run uh, Paraview in batch mode. I'm gonna give you many examples. Uh, later on in, in this webinar. So basically you will have to specify the output resolution of your file inside the Python script and then uh, start this, well run this uh, Python script from the command line using the pv bash command which is included into every version of Paraview and you will need to specify the use off screen rendering mode and then everything will just work. You can say 4K, 8K resolution, whatever you want. It will really render that high resolution. Um, so yeah, that's all I wanted to say about limitations. So otherwise, except for this bug, it works really well and it's actually pretty fast. So I was curious, I really wanted to uh, benchmark OpenGL rasterization for this uh, particular visualization uh, versus Osprey uh, ray tracing. And the way I decided to do this, I wrote my own Python script. So I'm gonna show you it on the next slide. And when I run this Python script with OpenGL and with Osprey, everything else is fixed. So what I'm doing, I'm taking exactly the same visualization I'm just building it now in Python script. And then I uh, ran it 270 times, and each time I rotate the object, so I spin the visualization one third of a degree around the vertical axis, so that in total my visualization spins uh, 90 degrees uh, around the vertical axis. And then uh, when I render each image, each one of the 270 frames, at the end I save it 
to the disk. So I have to save it to the disk because unfortunately Paraview and Linux is uh, smart enough that it, it, it knows that if I don't save it to the disk, it actually doesn't have to render it. So that's why I have to render and then save it to the disk. But fortunately, saving the file to the disk is actually negligible compared to the rendering time. And then, to so I have the uh, file wavelet.py. It's a Python script that I'm going to show in the next slide. And it's actually, I included into the zip file that, uh, that, is, uh, that I have a link to uh, on the title page. So you can download the wavelet uh, Python script and you can try it running it yourself and you can actually time it on your own machine and see how well it compares to my machine. So everything else uh, is the same. So exactly the same scene, exactly the same number of angles, exactly the same number of frames, uh, the same zoom, the same resolution uh, in Osprey and OpenGL. And I'm just uh, timing how many frames per second uh, I'm able to achieve with OpenGL and Osprey. So I run the benchmark on a single core. And here's the simplified version of the script because the script didn't fit, fit into the slide, but you have access to the full Python script in your in, in, in the zip file uh, that I provided at, at the very beginning. So uh, here the script is, so the beginning, the very first paragraph just loads the Paraview uh, module, everything from the Paraview.simple module and uh, loads the uh, time module, which is which I'm going to use for timing. And then uh, the second paragraph includes basically everything you need to uh, do uh, to render the uh, sphere. So it uh, brings up the, um, the wavelet source and then it applies the shrink filter and then applies the glue filter and sets up the radii and the resolution of individual uh, spheres. So the spheres, I actually here use high resolution so that rendering appears nicer. So 30, uh, 30 uh, points in the theta direction and 30 points in the phi direction. That's for each sphere, each one of the 5,000 spheres in my rendering. And then I set up the camera position. So I want to make sure that we use exactly the same focus, exactly the same camera position for the both, both visualizations. And then the next paragraph is commented out right now. So if you run the script as it is, it will do OpenGL uh, rendering. But if you uncomment it, you will see that it says enable Osprey uh, set to one. So that will turn off OpenGL uh, rendering and turn on uh, Osprey rendering on the CPU. Then I turn on shadows and then optionally I set the number of pixels. So I'm going to vary that in the benchmark on the next side. You will see, you will see the results. And then I basically uh, uh, use the get active camera to get the properties to the current view. And then one of the properties is azimuth function. Uh, and then I simply change whole azimuth function with uh, one third of a degree argument, and then I call it 270 times and uh, render the image and then save the screenshot. And basically that allows me to build 270 frames. And then I run this benchmark uh, without any GUI. So I don't have to start the private GUI. I simply run from the command line. So essentially I just say PV batch and then uh, pass the name of the Python code to it. Optionally, I can say use off screen rendering. And the only difference between these two is, um, is that, um, in the, first, in the first command, uh, it will bring up a window and render the image on the screen and then we'll save the image to the file. Whereas in the second case, it will just do rendering off screen and will save the file. So without bringing up any windows. And I found that the runtime, so the running time is very, very similar in both. So it actually doesn't really take any time to, uh, to uh, bring up a window and render the image um, in the window as opposed to uh, off screen rendering. And one other thing that I haven't mentioned, so I set the resolution here manually and I make sure that I actually save the image at that resolution. So that's 2080 by 720, that's 720p resolution. So here, here are the results. When I run this image, I get uh, roughly three frames per second in open gel. And if I enable Osprey and disable shadows and have one sample per pixel, so one sample per pixel means one ray per each uh, screen pixel, I get almost the same speed, 2.67 uh, frames per second. So that's almost the same performance as OpenGL. On, now on the CPU. If I enable sh shadows and still have one sample per pixel, that uh, brings, up, uh, brings the speed down to 1.62 frames per second. And then I enable, uh, when, when I do three rays per pixel, that slows down to 0.95 frames per second, and then 10 samples per pixel to 0.39 um, frames per second. So when you look at the results, uh, even having one ray per pixel is actually sufficiently good. So it will give you a fairly accurate visualization. And so if you compare the numbers that I highlighted here in red, you will see that, well, yes, Osprey rendering on the CPU, it's somewhat slower. So it's probably 55 or 60% of the speed of the OpenGL rendering on the GPU, but it's still sufficiently fast. So you can, if you have a system where you don't have any GPU at all, you can still do CPU rendering and it will be sufficiently fast. So just for fun, I tried two other things. I tried to do uh, 4K rendering and uh, 
with OpenGL at four, uh, sorry, not 4K rendering, four times number of pixels. So that's 14, uh, 1440p, four times number of pixels. So twice the resolution in each dimension. I get roughly four times slowdown. So OpenGL, I get 0.67 frames per second. And for Osprey with shadows and one ray per pixel, I get 0.43 frames per second. So that's roughly what you would expect when you have four times the number of pixels. And then also have a very, so my, my current notebook, all of this I, I, I ran on my current laptop, which is a fairly recent MacBook. And I also have a, a six year old MacBook Air lying around. And just for the fun of it, I try running OpenGL and Osprey and, and timing these. And I get 0.88 frames per second on in OpenGL and 0.21 frames per second uh, in my MacBook Air. But it's actually a first generation MacBook Air that was really, really underpowered. And still it performed not, not that bad. It's only four times uh, slower than, than OpenGL. All right. So the takeaway from the slide is that Osprey is actually quite, quite competitive to OpenGL. If you don't do crazy things, if you set your parameters in such a way that you have not that many rays per pixel, then it's actually quite comparable to OpenGL, uh, to OpenGL uh, rendering time. All right. So that's on the that's on the uh, on my uh, laptop. What about the cluster? So as I mentioned before, uh, pretty much all clusters except for parallel cluster in WestGrid don't have GPU. So I just for the sake of it, I used a uh, cluster called Bugaboo, which is actually local to SFU where I'm sitting now. And uh, so similar to uh, Mac OS on Linux, the pre-compiled version of Paraview has Osprey. So you need Paraview 5.1 or later has Osprey built in. So you can actually run everything I've just showed you on the laptop on the cluster. So the only caveat is that Paraview at runtime, uh, when you start it, it still needs to have an OpenGL contact. So when you start Paraview, it will be looking for OpenGL, uh, basically GPU drivers on your system. And if it doesn't find them, it will crash. So to start Paraview on the cluster, what you need to do, you need to uh, pass a flag. Uh, either you need to pass a flag to call, uh, to pick Mesa software rendering or uh, another flag to, to pick, um, uh, sorry, the first one is to pick Mesa software rendering with uh, the LLVM pipe software rasterizer that I mentioned before. The other one is to pick uh, Mesa software rendering, uh, rendering with the new OpenSwore rasterizer that I also mentioned before. So on the new systems, uh, both flags will work and both, both will just, just fine. Uh, on Bugaboo, unfortunately, the processes are based on the Westmere architecture, which goes back to 2009, 2010. And Westmere architecture does not support um, what is called advanced uh, vector uh, instruction set. So that's vectorization for speeding up your calculations on the CPU AVX. There, there, are, also several, uh, there are also several standards since then, so AVX2 and AVX512 for Xeon Phi's. So Bugaboo processes, unfortunately, very old, so they don't support AVX. So that means I cannot actually uh, use the run the open SWARE software rasterizer from Intel. So I'm limited on Bugaboo. I'm limited to the uh, to the uh, LLVM pipe software rasterizer with Mason. But that's fine. I can still I can still use it. So all I have to do is uh, start Paraview with the um, dash dash uh, Mason dash LLVM flag to pick up the corresponding uh, rasterizer. So uh, I'm going to run the demo now. Uh, what I want to mention here is that. Uh, you can actually file, uh, find the library called uh, libgl. So that's the uh, open source Mesa replacement for the OpenGL library, but now it's a software-based uh, library. And it's uh, shipped uh, in pre-compiled Paraview. You can actually uh, dig down into your Paraview file character and, and, and find it there. So this is the one I'm going to use now. Okay. So uh, I'm going to switch to my terminal. And just before the start of the workshop, I started an interactive job on the Bugaboo clusters here. So here I log, I, I, I'm logged into the, um, uh, the uh, login node on Bugaboo and I ran the QSUB job. I passed a number of um, flags to it. So basically what I did, I asked for a specific node, uh, uh, 402 node. You don't have to, to ask for it, but in this case, it was reserved for this demo. Uh, so that well, I have to make sure that nobody else is running anything uh, CPU intensive on, on that node. That's why I want, wanted uh, to reserve the node uh, for this particular demo. And I specify that I want to use a single processor. So I'm going to show you just the serial rendering. Uh, I need not more than uh, 2,000 megabytes, so two, two gigabytes uh, per, per node, per, per processor for, for this visualization. And I ask for 60 minutes. Um, so the, the job will, will run for 60 minutes and that will terminate. And then I need to pass the minus I flag. So the, the minus I flag is important. It ensures that 
when the job starts and actually takes not more than a minute or two uh, for the job to start. It ensures that when the job starts, uh, it starts an interactive, it gives you back an interactive prompt on the compute node, which is now running the job and everything you type here interactively on the prompt is gonna be part of the job, okay? So I can do things here, for example, I can look things like uh, PBS variables and there's a whole bunch of them. So for example, PBS num uh, nodes will tell me that I'm running this job on a single uh, node and PBS num uh, PPN processes per node will also return one. It'll tell me that I'm running this job on a single node, all right? So what I'm gonna do now, I will start a VNC server. A VNC server. I want to fit it my laptop, uh, my laptop screen, but you can specify anything essentially you need. So the VNC server, when, when it starts, the VNC server is starting as part of the uh, scheduled job on the compute node on the cluster. So it returns back uh, the prompt and it says that it's waiting. So the desktop is ready, it's waiting on the compute node B402, so that's the current node, and it's waiting on the terminal one. So that's the important number uh, to note. Now I'm gonna switch to another uh, terminal on my laptop and I'm gonna copy and paste the following command. I'm gonna explain to you what, what it means. So here I'm establishing uh, SSH port forwarding. Basically, I take uh, a port uh, 5901 on my laptop. So that's the standard default port for VNC. I'm gonna open a VNC remote desktop connection now. So that's the standard port on the VNC on my uh, local laptop. And I'm linking it to the same port 5901 on the compute node B42 on the uh, Bugaboo cluster. And this number 5901 is also, so the, the way it works, the default port for VNC is 5900. And to that, I add the display number. So re remember number one that was returned right here. So it said waiting on this node on this display. So one is the display number that I use right here. So that's the remote port where the VNC server is waiting. So, okay, so I, when I ran this command on my laptop, I established the uh, port, uh, port, uh, port forwarding connection between the local port, local VNC port, and the remote VNC port where it's waiting for a connection, okay? And now all I have to do is start a VNC uh, client. So I prefer Turbo VNC, but there are a number of VNC clients that will work with this. And it will ask, it will actually, it's asking me for a VNC server. So let me drag that small window right here. So I'm connecting to localhost one. So because already established VNC, uh, sorry, um, SSH port forwarding, uh, well, port forwarding by SSH, uh, all I need to do is point uh, Turbo VNC to the local port, which is connected to the remote port where the VNC server is waiting. So I just print, press enter, and then it asks me for a password. So I'll type the default, um, well, my, my own VNC password that I have set up earlier. So you don't have, it's an optional step. You don't have to set it up. It's not the same as your Westgrid or Compute Candidate password. It's specifically a VNC password that you have an option of setting before you start the VNC server. Okay, I press enter and then it opens a desktop, which I have to drag to this window. And here I can actually uh, start all applications. I start as, um, inside this desktop, they will be running on the compute node as part of the scheduled job that I started uh, 15, well, about 30 minutes ago. So what I'm going to do now, I will switch to the um, to the terminal where I'm logged into the uh, BFO2. So that's part of the running job, the terminal which is part of the running job. And uh, then I'm going to uh, set up the display variable right here. So this makes sure that everything, all graphics applications that I open from the command line right here will go to the uh, display number one and will, will be displayed, the windows from those applications will be displayed on the, um, on the um, inside the VNC desktop that I just opened a couple of minutes ago. So uh, also to have uh, to access the latest pair view, I need to uh, load it with the module command. So I just see module load pair view 5.1.2. That's the recent version of pair view. And then I need to say to uh, say pair view and pass the MESA LLVM option to enable, to pick up the uh, LLVM software rasterizer. So when I do this, it opens Paraview inside my VNC desktop, and here we go. So here we're running exactly, well, it's exactly the same version of Paraview I ran on my desktop, but now we're running on Linux as part of the uh, scheduled job on the cluster. So uh, I'm gonna do exactly the same set of steps. I just wanna bring up the um, wavelet source, hit apply, apply the shrink filter to it, right here. Hit apply, just default values. Then apply the 
glyph filter. Uh, for a glyph, I choose a sphere and then set its radius to 0.2. The default is 5,000 spheres, so I hit apply. And then I turn off the cells. So now I have only the spheres. So now what's happening, we started Paraview uh, with uh, Mesa, uh, LLVM uh, software rasterizer. So we're actually doing uh, rendering now on the CPU. It's very slow. So now if I try to drag this, it'll be really, really painful slowly. I, I don't think I'll be able actually to see, so it'll take some time to refresh. But trust me, it takes a few seconds for the image to refresh and it's not interactive at all. So that's the problem with uh, Mesa uh, software rasterizer, sorry, Mesa LLVM software rasterizer, is that it's very old. So the full name for it is Gallium LLVM pipe software rasterizer. And it's been, it was coded, I think probably around 10, 12 years ago. And uh, it's still actively maintained. It's fantastic rasterizer, but it uses fairly old algorithms. So when you run it on old hardware, it's be, it'll be very, very slow. So now I'm gonna switch to uh, Osprey Ray Tracer. So I just said enable Osprey. And now it's enabled. And then I try to spin it and it's much smoother. So it's actually very, very uh, responsive now. I can spin the, uh, the, the object and it's, it's spinning in as well interactively as, 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 as I, as I uh, drag it, which is fantastic. So it's much faster than LLVM pipe uh, rasterizer. And I also can enable shadows. And it's also responsive, so it's not now as fast, but it's so responsive, I can spin it and it, uh, it, it tracks, so it's, it's very interactive. Okay, so exactly the same result as, as on my laptop, but now we're just running everything on a CPU on the, on the uh, compute node as part of scheduled job on the Bugaboo cluster. So now if, for example, I go to file, open, it will uh, prompt, give a prompt uh, with a file system local to the cluster, right? So you have some large data set there, then I can actually navigate to the data set and open it in Paraview and then visualize it with Osprey. <clears throat> um, so uh, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do now, I will kill this, uh, stop this Paraview, and then I will switch back to my slides. So I'm not gonna do benchmarks um, right now in real time, but I'm gonna show you the results. So I ran exactly the same benchmark, wavelet.py at 720p resolution on uh, the cluster using Mesa LVM software rasterizer and using the new Osprey uh, ray tracer with shadows and one ray per pixel. And uh, the ray tracer actually ran 18 times faster. Though, so that's a significant difference. So uh, that's why <clears throat> when I interacted with, uh, well, inside the VNC desktop, it's really, really, uh, interactive, it's very re responsive and it, it works really well. Whereas with uh, Mesa LLVM rasterizer, you had to wait a few seconds before anything happens and then it will do it one frame, next frame, and it's really very annoying. So like Mesa LLVM um, rasterizer, Osprey gives you really interactive visualizations. So unfortunately, as I mentioned before, uh, Bugaboo cluster has all the processes with Westmay architecture that don't support uh, OpenSwar library. Uh, so, but if you have a new system, you can actually run uh, Mesa OpenSwar. So you would uh, start Paraview with the dash dash Mesa uh, dash swore uh, flag. And then uh, Paraview will start initially with the, with the open swore rasterizer. And then optionally you can switch later on between the open swore rasterizer and the Osprey uh, ray tracer. And you can benchmark the two. And I'll actually be very curious in hearing the benchmark results. So if somebody cares, if somebody has a new system, uh, then, uh, then by all means, please send me the benchmark results. I'll be very interested in, in, in uh, hearing these. All right, so, uh, so far we rendered polygonal uh, geometries, uh, but as I mentioned before, uh, Osprey supports non-polygonal geometries as well. So cones, um, cylinders, and spheres. And what you can do uh, to demo that is um, you can um, bring up um, here, for example, I have uh, the same wavelet source. And then the wheel so has only a single mathematical function, so a single three-dimensional function inside it. And then I apply the gradient filter to it. So gradient filter will give you vector gradients. And then I visualize these vector gradients with the uh, streamline, uh, stream trace um, uh, filter. And then I try to visualize that in Osprey. So uh, one caveat about visualizing stream trace, uh, uh, streamlines uh, in Osprey is that uh, current implementation is very buggy. So, um, so it might work for you, it might crash. So if you try to implement, if you try, sorry, try to um, apply Osprey rendering 
to the output of stream trace itself, it will be fairly boring because uh, the lines are infinitely thin. So it will, you will see certainly some effect, but there will be no sh uh, any realistic shadows and you will not see anything particularly interesting. So what you can do, you can either apply a tube filter to the output of the uh, stream tracer filter to make these line, lines thicker and then uh, visualize that with Ospray. Or, uh, or you can also uh, use just the stream tracer filter for the uh, uh, stream lines. But <clears throat> then in properties in Paraview, uh, there is another uh, place where you will see, where you will see uh, Ospray. So, Switching back to Paraview on my laptop. Here, remember these options, enable Osprey and shadows in the properties of the Glyph filter. So if I scroll uh, a little bit up, you will see another place where Osprey is mentioned, where it says Osprey use scale arrays. arrays. And what it does, it will let you uh, visualize the infinitely small thickness of points and streamlines. Mathematically, streamlines have radius zero. With finite thickness and use an existing scale array uh, to, um, uh, well, to essentially give a value to the thickness. So the uh, thickness will be proportional to the value of your scalar function at each point. Uh, so if you enable that, you can actually see streamlines that are that are that that have uh, finite uh, thickness. And that works, but in my opinion, it's also not particularly interesting. So uh, it's, it will give you finite thickness, uh, but the result is not as spectacular as applying the uh, tube filter to the outer of the stream tracer filter. So here I'm showing the uh, two visualizations. On the left, you have exactly the same stream tracer plus a tube um, visualization in OpenGL, which is very flat. There are no shadows. There's no way to bring up shadows in, in OpenGL visualization. And on the right, you have Osprey visualization, visualization with shadows enabled. <clears throat> And as you can see, the result is actually drastically different because you see the three-dimensional effect. So you see where the shadows fall and you see how far the shadows are from the streamlines. And this really brings up the three-dimensionality of the picture. So that's really, really good if you have a lot of intricate details, uh, very complex details, and you want to bring up the depth effect and the three, highlight the three-dimensionality of the, this picture. So I find that in this case, Osprey is really very useful. Um, so. So far, the examples I showed you uh, did only surface rendering, but I mentioned in the beginning that Osprey is also capable of doing volumetric rendering. Uh, so the, the only reason to do this is uh, to do volumetric rendering with Osprey is if your uh, system does not have any, does not have a GPU card. Uh, then um, you will get essentially the same result as from OpenGL volumetric rendering. And the result will look very, very similar to what you'll get with OpenGL. So there's really no good uh, reason to do uh, volume rendering with Osprey uh, unless uh, your system simply doesn't have a GPU card. For example, a cluster, a buggable cluster, there I would, uh, 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 for volumetric rendering, I would switch to Osprey. Right, so the data that I'm showing here is a, um, is, is a rendering, uh, so it's a simulation of isotropic uh, turbulence, and it's actually from the Osprey uh, website. So the data set is 256 cube, and uh, I have uh, yeah I have a state file which I can't remember if I gave you most likely you don't have the state file because you also need the data set, uh, and the data set is fairly large, so I didn't want to include that into the zip file. But if I run this, so let me start, so let me quit Paraview on my system and go back to the command line on my laptop, so right here, and then I'll restart Paraview, passing the state file name, so state. It's called turbulence.pvsm, and let's see what it does. Of course, it starts Paraview on a different uh, screen, so I need to drag the screen uh, to my shared uh, screen. So here we go. Let me just maximize this, this. So here we have, let me just double check that we're doing Osprey. Yeah, we're doing enable Osprey. So we're doing Osprey volume rendering, and actually for volumetric rendering, it doesn't make any sense to enable shadows. It will not really uh, make any difference. So uh, here we have a very nice uh, rendering of flames, or not flames, sorry, of isotropic turbulence. Looks like flames. And uh, it's very, very responsive. So I'm doing visualization on the CPU on my laptop, and I can spin it. I don't see any delay, so it's fantastically responsive. Of course, you would say that the data set is 256 cube. Uh, it's very small. It should be responsive. Well, yes, but I also uh, did benchmarking of OpenGL volumetric rendering versus Osprey um, ray tracing, and I see virtually no difference. So they are very, very they give uh, very, very similar uh, frame rates. Which means that if you're in a system that doesn't have any uh, GPU card, then Osprey is is really the only alternative that you can use for volumetric rendering. 
So here's another example. It's exactly the same uh, 256 turbulence data set. Here I'm rendering it with um, drag my video screen. So here I'm running with uh, OpenGL and here I'm running it with Osprey. So let me go back to the uh, first OpenGL picture and pause here for a moment. So OpenGL result looks uh, really nice, but you see what's interesting here is that while each, so this um, is in uh, basically rendering of uh, an ISO, a single ISO surface at a given value, but just, well, just because of the nature of the data set is turbulent, so it's very chaotic. You have many, uh, many surfaces um, in the visualization. And notice that each surface is uh, rendered quite beautifully, but there are no shadows. So each surface is illuminated exactly from one side, but you don't really have a three-dimensional effect in the sense that you don't know where each surface is. So uh, relative to the other surfaces. So you can see that there is there is certainly occlusion. The surfaces are, some surfaces are sitting behind other surfaces, but there are no shadows. So if I say, if I switch to OpenGL, the picture is in, enable shadows. The picture is very different. Exactly the same data set, exactly the same um, perspective, time reposition. But now we have shadows enabled and you see that the picture is very different. And I guess this really depends on your uh, personal preference. I much, much prefer the Osprey picture simply because it, in, in such a complex data set with lots of details, it lets you highlight the, well, it, give you, it gives you the uh, depth effect, right? So you know where each surface is sitting relative to the other surfaces. So that's all I wanted to show for, uh, for in terms of demos. Uh, so this is my last slide. Conclusions, um, Osprey is really, really good. It's uh, great in, in terms of performance, so it's very comparable to OpenGL. It's slightly slow, so running at 55%, maybe 60%, uh, the speed of <coughs> excuse me, OpenGL on my laptop, but it's very comparable. It's also very comparable uh, to, uh, to, um, to OpenGL rendering on a cluster if you have a GPU card. Uh, so many systems don't have GPU cards, and that's where you would certainly want to use Osprey because it's so much faster than uh, the older uh, software rasterizers such as uh, LLVM pipe. A uh, few things I haven't mentioned. So um, Osprey theoretically uh, supports, uh, well, the o Osprey project itself supports rendering with MPI. It has MPI device as one of the backends. I haven't managed to make parallel uh, rendering in Osprey work on the cluster, and I don't know what the reason is. Uh, so um, the pre-compiled version of Paraview shapes with its own uh, MPI exec. So that means you're not really tied to the systems version of uh, the MPI library. Uh, so if you use MPI exec uh, that is included into Paraview, you can actually run Paraview in parallel. It, it, it works really well. Uh, if uh, you do any, well, if uh, it works really well for data processing, but for, um, for Osprey uh, ray tracing, somehow I get exactly the same set of processes running in parallel, but the job is not decomposed. And I don't really know what, what the problem is. Also, I have mentioned uh, client server Osprey rendering. It's also possible. It's not, you cannot do it with the pre-compiled version of Paraview. So you actually have to recompile the version of Paraview that I was using in Bugaboo uh, with uh, support for off-screen rendering. And then you will start the Paraview server with uh, you, you uh, use off-screen uh, rendering uh, flag, and then uh, use a uh, client on your laptop to connect to that uh, instance of Paraview server, and then things should work for you in the client server mode. Um, I haven't benchmarked OpenSwore, as I mentioned. I would be really curious in hearing results from any of you who uh, managed to benchmark and compare to the, uh, to the uh, other ray traces and, and, and uh, rasterizers. Uh, so that's all I have for this presentation. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left for questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and uh, let me know. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? If you don't have a working microphone, you can also uh, type your questions into the chat 
window, if you hover over the video desk, uh, a video, um, um, the video window, uh, it will give you a menu, and the second icon in the menu is open the chat window, and there you can type questions, and I'll be happy to answer them. So one question is from Marcelo, have you tried it with Visit? No, I have not. So I know that Visit supports uh, Osprey. I don't know if the pre-compiled Visit supports Osprey, or you have to try to recompile it yourself. I haven't looked uh, into this, but it's certainly something worth looking at. I know that Visit supports Osprey, so, so the only question is whether you have to recompile it or it's included into the pre-compiled version. Okay. If there are no further questions, um, we will stop the recording. So the, uh, the, the webinar was recorded, and in a few days we'll post a link on the Westgrid website. And um, that's all I have. So thank you very much for attending. And if you have further questions, if uh, you have trouble uh, running Osprey uh, yourself, or if you try, if you want to try uh, OpenSwore, you want to benchmark it, please uh, send me an email. Uh, my email address is alex.razumov at westgrid.ca. So thank you, uh, thank you very much, everyone.